My name is Anders Wittfeldt, I'm a student in the Department of Epidemiology, and it's my great pleasure today to introduce at this forum Dr. Gro Harlem Brundtland. Dr. Brundtland earned her medical degree at the University of Oslo and went on to obtain a Master of Public Health degree at the Harvard School of Public Health in 1965. Following her time at Harvard, she was employed in a public health function uh, in the Norwegian government. During this time, she was able to utilize the skills learned at Harvard uh, to publish articles on reproductive health in scientific journals, including Nature. She was subsequently appointed Minister of the Environment in 1974, focusing on the links between public health and the environment. She first became Prime Minister of Norway in 1981 and served three terms. Um, her tenure as Prime Minister is universally remembered as unifying with a personal popularity that went far beyond the Labour Party which she represented. Two years after her resignation as Prime Minister, she was appointed Director General of the World Health Organization where her cabinet included the Dean of the Faculty of Public Health, Professor Julio Frank. Her leadership as Director General uh, is widely considered to have been successful. Among her accomplishments were negotiating a major multilateral treaty on tobacco, as well as the rapid response to the SARS epidemic, for which she was named Policy Leader of the Year by Scientific American magazine. Dr. Brentland serves on numerous international uh, committees and panels and travels and lectures extensively as a leading voice on climate change, for a healthier and better educated world and for as a major champion of sustainable development. She holds honorary degrees from major universities including Harvard, Yale, and Oxford, but perhaps her most prized award is her unofficial title in her native Norway where she's affectionately known as Landsmoderen, or Mother of the Nation. <laughs> Please give Dr. Brentland a warm welcome back to the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, the discussion will be led by Professor Brandt. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I'd like just to add a, a few words of uh, welcome. Uh, it is true that uh, one of um, the many privileges I've had in life was to be invited by Gro Harlan Brundtland when she became uh, Director General of WHO to join her cabinet as Executive Director in charge of a whole new area called Evidence and Information for Policy. This was, as far as I know, the first ever specialized unit within WHO devoted to applying uh, scientifically derived evidence to policy making. And um, it was a fantastic experience uh, that uh, I can only uh, summarize by saying that uh, Dr. Brunland is truly one of the most inspirational leaders that I have ever had the opportunity to work with. And it was both because of her strong commitment to using science um, to drive policy and her personal courage to make tough decisions. And that's why we thought that um, having her here as our commencement speaker, it was a great opportunity to also invite her to this series, um, which we have started at the Harvard School of Public Health, called uh, Voices from the Field. And it is all around decision making. This was a request from our students who want this kind of direct contact with people who've made decisions to understand what's the logic, the processes that lead to decision making. And that's the purpose uh, uh, of, of today. Um, we're going to be, the, the title of the session is on the role of WHO, a leader's perspective. But we actually want you, grow to, to take a larger perspective, not just your time at WHO, but the path that led you there as well. Um, all the way from your days as a student, when you were probably, like many of our students here, dreaming uh, about making the world a better place. And then you actually went out and did that. You <laughs> did make <laughs> well, a much better place, um, both through your engagement in, in, in enlightened politics um, in, in your home country, but then your leadership of the, uh, 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 a new way of thinking about the environment, including the uh, famous Brundtland Report that coined the concept of sustainable development. And then on to WHO, where you certainly faced a number of very, very interesting um, decisions that I hope we, we, you can share with us. Uh, as you know, um, in addition to our studio audience, the uh, event will be uh, posted for webcasting. <coughs> and our experience is that many thousands of people will be actually watching uh, this uh, eventually. And that uh, this conversation hopefully will um, uh, allow us to gain even more insights into the way in which great leaders make tough decisions. So with that um, introduction, um, let me uh, just <coughs> start with, with a general question. And then we really invite all of you to, to, uh, to formulate your questions and 
just identify yourselves and address your questions. But before that, uh, we thought we would uh, ask uh, Dr. Brundtland just to give us some opening uh, remarks about her own reflections of her path, uh, and then we will have this dialogue. So, Grove, over Good. to you. Thank you, Julio. Well, you know, um, I was only 25 uh, when I came here to the school. And just directly after the first hospital year, after the medical degree. And um, I was, of course, uh, inspired by my father being a doctor. But my father also became Minister of Health and Social Affairs and Minister of Defense uh, later on. But so uh, that was some of the background. So as you said, it is, you know, the, the thinking how can I make a difference and influence people's lives and societies in the best way? So that was the thinking coming here. But I was lucky in the sense that I was the youngest in my class. Uh, I met experience, more experienced people who had been out in working life in and across the world because there were so many international students here. So it was a great learning experience in addition to, you know, the concrete expertise that we gained uh, by, go by being here a year for Master of Public Health. So it really changed and also made more, even more fundamental and I was re-convinced uh, about my own values, the values about uh, equality and human rights, and common responsibilities across borders. All of that was set in my whole uh, attitude to life, uh, and, and the year here was really influential in doing so. Then I had public health experience, as Anders Wittfeld said, in the Norwegian Public Health Service, governmental, Oslo level also at the Oslo city level, as gradually deputy leader of the school health services, where I introduced new ways of prevention and new ways of dealing with how the medical service helped school children um, to avoid unnecessary developmental uh, failures and so on. Now then, during those years, also at the level of Directorate of Health, Ministry of Health, I pushed policies in key areas of public health. One of them being promotion of breastfeeding. Why? Because even in advanced Norway, women have started to kind of not be so concerned about doing this, uh, nursing their children. You know, there were so many nice practical things you could do instead. Now, so I, uh, I had studied this issue as my, my choice of writing a paper when I was a maternal and child health major here. And I studied uh, uh, breastfeeding across the world historically and its practical and health consequences for the baby and the mother, you know. So I was pushing this policy. And, you know, today, um, women in Norway nurse more than 90% for several months. So that started in turning the wrong tide back already in the 1970s or uh, no. Uh, end of 60s when I was back in Norway pushing this issue. And then when I was prime minister in 1981, the WHO was working on uh, a code on breastfeeding. The conduct with the industry, you know, was being attacked for being advertising much too early to have alternative feeding. So I, I remember giving the instruction to my, the people who went to WHO in 1981 we are going to succeed in getting this call through. So I this is a continuous thing from my paper at Harvard until today. Now is an example that illustrates something. You stay on the things you are convinced about and you work on it in different positions and diff with different possibilities that you have in different parts of your life. Um, now, something happened to me which, which was strange, which happens to few people. But I was yesterday at Yale, and I realized there's, there's another politician that has the same kind of path. George Mitchell was one of the honorands yesterday at Yale with me. 
And as he spoke at the dinner, he told his life story. And I realized that what happened to me happened to him. He had a telephone asking him, complete surprise to him, that he should, he, he was uh, we wanted to become the succeeding senator after, Mu after um, Muskie left his position. So George Mitchell was called, can you please stand as our new senator from Maine? What happened to me was the prime minister of Norway called me, or not, he didn't call me. He had people pick me up and ask me to come to his office. I was in the middle of my public health work. I was also working on policy issues, even in the area of the law on abortion. So I had written a couple of articles about this issue. Maybe the prime minister had noticed, I'm not sure. He called me to his office. He said, you know, good morning and so on. How are your parents? Because we knew him, not very close, but yeah. And then he said, I want you to enter the government. I was, you know, completely dumbfounded. But I, and I said, look, I need some time to think about this. No, no, you have only until 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock something. <laughs> okay. But it, this thing, having to make a decision within a few hours uh, about something as essential as taking on a big responsibility like that, when you had no such plans, you hadn't campaigned for it, you never had thought you would enter the political scene in that sense. I was an activist on several issues, you know, in the community, speaking out on issues and so on, but I never thought I would seek political office until I was asked to. Now, okay, but it has then determined the rest of my life, the decision I made to say yes. Um, like George Mitchell, by the way, who for 40 years after that, was a dominating figure in the American Senate. Now, so I was, what also happened to me there was I learned something fundamental. I entered the door of the Ministry of Environment. And you know, at the moment the Prime Minister said, I want you to be Minister of Environment, I was shocked even more. Because I was a health person, I was a public health expert. You know, if he had asked me to do Ministry of Health, I wouldn't have been as shocked. But so I realized, then I realized, look, you know, environment, wh why are we concerned about the environment? Because of human beings, because of populations, because of its consequences for health and for our society. So I realized quickly that my background from here and from my medical studies were indeed relevant to what I was going to do. That was the first thing I, you know, and I started doing it quickly starting, you know, asking questions from the perspective of health and people, even more than the people who were the officials in the ministry, they were concentrating on, on birds, on, on, you know, different types of species that were being undermined by people, yes, by us. But I turned many of the questions the other way, and by that reasoning, we had more breakthrough in public debate in Norway because I linked the environment to people and to health and to the future of our societies. Not only Norway, but more broadly internationally. Now, uh, the other thing that happened was I realized how greatly my influence increased. I was interested in promoting good public, public policy already before I all of a sudden was a minister. A woman at the top of one ministry of Norway known to everybody, speaking out on every issue, getting noticed. And you know, within a few weeks I knew very clearly how much more responsibility and potential influence I had gotten from being this. A few months later only, I was asked to become deputy leader of my party. Why? Because they now realized we need some more women at the highest level, even in our party. And, and secondly, they had noted me over those months when I spoke out on a number of issues, traveled around the country, went out around uh, to also to other countries. I, I remember I had the responsibility to lead 
the OECDs, the first environment ministry meeting of the OECD. It was fascinating because I studied before we went there with my people, how are we going to get this uh, recommendation through? And I remember one issue, um, polluter pays principle. What already then in 1974, uh, an issue that we tried to get consensus on from the ministers of environment across Europe or across OECD, including US. And then I, 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 I asked, who are the people who are difficult here? And they told me, you know, I came one day earlier. I asked to see bilaterally the most difficult people, got to know them, talked with them, inspired them. And we got the whole thing through, also including the polluter pays principle. Now, it just, it, you know, I realized I had gotten a privilege by, by being asked to, uh, to all of a sudden to be minister and use the opportunities it gave me. Now, then I made another decision that day when the prime minister asked me, which an important decision, I think, for my life. And I think for all of you, you should think about it. I realized, you know, I'm doing something very different now. I haven't asked for it. I'm being asked to serve and I do it. But I'm not going to get caught into political <coughs> entanglement, which is going to in some way, in any way, uh, undermine my integrity, my personal convictions, my integrity as a person and the values I'm based on. So I decided there and then, whatever brings this brings me to later in life, I will always know I can say, this is enough. I have a profession I can return to. I'm not dependent on being re-elected or reappointed as a politician. It gave me very strong, um, I think, uh, sense of what in fact, it means being a leader because you cannot lose your own personality as you do it. You can work for others. You can represent your country. You can represent people in other countries who are poor. You can do, but you mustn't undermine your own integrity in doing so. Okay, so that was an important decision I made. Um, so then you mentioned the, the Commission on Environment and Development, Julio. Just a few words about that. Again, I was asked by the Secretary General. I had been Prime Minister then, by then uh, in one short period of nine months. Then I was leader of the opposition. I was asked by the Secretary General of the United Nations to lead this commission to look at the links between health, being environment and development. And I made, I, I, I made two conditions, you know, I said, we have to be independent. We are not going to take instructions. If I'm going to have a commission, I'm not going to take instructions from UNEP about what we are thinking and what we are is proposing. So it was the independent financing and structure of my secretariat and the people I chose to be my commissioners. That was one thing. The second was, I want more than half to be from the developing world. So I'm not going to be pushed to put every important nation on the Security Council onto the Commission, because then I will not have a majority from the developing world. And I cannot answer the question, how do we combine environment and development unless we have the whole world thinking together? So then, then uh, when my term as prime minister in, in 1996 came to an end. In the first year I was in parliament. I, I, it ended because I just one day announced that I'm leaving. And my successor as a, deputy, as a leader of the party will take over. People were shocked. Nobody wanted me to go. But it was a good thing, you know, to be able to do it this way. I kept my integrity, you know, in, in this way also to the end. Now, but then people ask me, you know, about WHO. And uh, I realized this is returning to my whole background in health and public health. 
and the whole links between environment and health, sustainable development, all that I had worked on. Even combining what I did here with breastfeeding, Cairo, Beijing, the big conferences, not only Rio, which was inspired by our report, Our Common Future, but all the other major issues that are linked to maternal and child health, reproductive health, environment, health, you know, all, uh, human rights. Well, so WHO then uh, became my next place. And um, what happened in WHO was, I would say, uh, that, so, one thing I haven't really men mentioned yet, I know, I realize is that from the beginning, decisions to move, decisions to act, decisions to make policies, even in my younger years as a public health officer, uh, I always felt must be based on evidence, must be based on evidence research as well as based on values. So respect for knowledge, for research and evidence was part of my basic beliefs from the beginning. And in the whole time of my political life, first as a doctor, then as a public health expert, then as a politician, a leader in politics, uh, this was how I thought. And I brought this with me to WHO, where uh, I took with me Julio Frank, uh, who was one of the people I met here at Harvard School of Public Health at the 75th anniversary when I spoke here. And Julio took me aside with Jamie Sepulveda from Mexico and told me, Grow, you know, you have to be the next WHO leader. So he was, he was also influential in bringing me there and convincing me that I should take on that responsibility. Now, so what did I knew? You have to raise health to the political agenda in, in addition to raise the level of evidence. So that was the other aspect. I knew as a political leader, if these poor health ministers are going to deal with all these important issues on their own, with no support from the finance minister, from the prime minister, they are lost. So that's this, the way of moving health onto the political agenda in countries and internationally was part of my you know, profile as I entered and the way I worked. So we worked uh, on malaria, on tobacco, uh, on immunization, on AIDS, <laughs> tuberculosis and malaria, as, as I mentioned, um, on nutrition, diets, and um, prevention of chronic disease. All of these also were based on the work that Julio and Chris Murray together did on presenting <laughs> you know, the total burden of disease where are the most important areas that we need to uh, work on and have people understand the importance of and then move on them. And then also we made alliances uh, such as Gavi and the Global Fund. And I'm sure you all know of, of those uh, in your, um, from your own studies. Now lastly, we strengthened WHO as the center of excellence by entering Julio and others in at the level they were and given the opportunities they were given because we raised funding to make this happen. So the standing of WHO increased, but it also, you know, was very helpful when the SARS, the new and unknown disease SARS appeared on the arena the last year I was in WHO. Because we had strengthened WHO, and because I could use my political background, to because I, I knew that WHO had to be responsible and take action, and I knew that any as a government leader, you have to do that. You have to take decisions, even if they are difficult and people are opposing them. And I felt the responsibility of, of WHO, but the way that, that I felt I had confidence enough to do it, I know uh, made a big difference in how quickly we acted on SARS and how we succeeded against opposition, partly, in having a, you know, a real campaign with travel recommendations and a systematic approach to get rid of that disease. 
Um, so when I now see, and I saw it in your article, Barry, today, the Nature article, uh, because you quoted there what now is in the international health regulations, what the, the language. This, the, the work on the international health regulations was being done while I was there, and it was finished after I left. But the, the point is, if we had not succeeded as well in doing SARS, I'm not sure we would have had the language of the international health regulations. They say that the ro on the, on the, uh, on the ro uh, role of WHO to take all necessary action to prevent the international spread of disease. So now WHO in a convention that has agreed that this is the role of WHO. When we did it in 2003, it was not self-evident. There was no such language. And many of the officials in WHO were scared because they knew people would react if we were assertive. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, <clears throat> anyone who's listening will uh, qualify for a PhD in, in uh, skillful decision making and courageous decision making. But uh, here you have a, a decision maker. Uh, I don't think there's a large number of um, ministers uh, of the environment and then prime ministers who actually uh, came to that position having already published a paper in Nature, a <laughs> uh, scientific <laughs> paper. So obviously you brought that baggage. Uh, and I think your, your remarks um, uh, speak very, very, very highly of, of that. And I, I have to say, <coughs> before I open it up, that <coughs> the... Um, the, the, the atmosphere at WHO when you arrived with this I, I, double um, strength, these two pillars of integrity and then adherence to science and evidence, integrity and excellence, was, was so transformative um, that, that it was really a, a breath of fresh air. And, and it did, I think, contribute to the increasing the standing of, of WHO. Uh, so let me um, open it up for uh, questions, and uh, maybe while you're thinking about your questions, given your previous background, I mean, can, can, can you tell us a little bit more about your insights on how you actually use evidence to make a decision? How, how is that translation happening? You have the knowledge, now you have to make a decision. Just tell us. Uh, uh, what, what have been your, your reflections on, yeah. on, on that process? You know, at Yale yesterday, I met Richard Pito. Right. He w I, I mentioned George Mitchell. Richard Pito was another of the honorants at Yale yesterday. Who is Richard Pito? I hope you all know who he is. Yeah. But he's an example. That's why I'm, I'm mentioning. When, yeah. when I was in WHO and we were working, on a number of key issues where the question was to analyze the evidence and to look at what it tells us about what needs to be done. Richard Pito had things in his research and his writing to contribute to the, the way we could argue the tobacco case. And the content of the campaign by a person respected for his research uh, efforts, but also his ability to be interested in pushing for action on what he knew. You see, I mean, the researchers in an ivory tower, unless somebody else picks up on them and carries the messages, now, sometimes nothing much happens. Now, Richard Pito is an example then of the kind of people I listen to, not only in WHO, uh, but but also before as a young minister and so on. I, I asked people with knowledge to come to my office and share their experience and then have critical remarks from me about what does this evidence tell us? What are the priorities? How important is this issue? Because we, you, unless you know about the issue and it's, it's the facts of it, how can you, you know, there is always lack of resources to move on issues. Unless you know which ones are the most important, how can you make the right priority? And there is no other common evidence base. 
There are two. There are values that, as, as if they are shared, humanity is able to move or countries are able to move on a certain policy issue. But the other issue is science and evidence. You know, if people have different opinions across the world about the facts of an issue, how can they then overcome their historical, cultural, and other differences in order to work together to move and to act on things to change people's lives and to improve uh, mortality statistics and so on, which we did on the tobacco. We did it. There was a lot of conflict around uh, blood pressure. Was it necessary to treat blood pressure if it is 150 or 145 or not? Many Norwegian doctors felt it was overkill. We were overdoing, you know, when specialists said that they should be treated by blood pressure re reducing, uh, to, in to reduce the mortality from heart, stroke, etc. And I had the specialist there rethink in WHO because I couldn't be sure, because the, the accusation was there has been influence from the pharmaceutical industry that makes them say that they should be treated from 145 or 50. Uh, yeah. So I needed to know. I couldn't make a decision whether this would be the right protocol, the right guidelines that WHO should follow until this had been checked. So it took one and a half year or so when other specialists were put together that nobody could say had any links to the pharmaceutical industry and they reconsidered the whole story and I could not know and I did not know whether they would land supporting the former decision or with an alternative position. In the end they did support what originally was done and it illustrated that the suspicion that the pharmaceutical industry had had an unreasonable influence on it was not correct because even other specialists who were looking at the evidence came to the same conclusion. Now, it, this is another example from the time in WHO, but I always worked like this in my whole life, you know. As decisions were made, I never felt confident unless I was sure of the knowledge base. So, um, yeah. So, you know, your, your point illustrates a, something I've, I've always believed that when we talk about evidence-based policy, we of course need to work on the supply side of the evidence, the research we do. Yeah. But equally important is to work on the demand side, mm -hmm. on developing that part of leadership competencies which allows a, a, a decision maker to identify yeah. the need for good evidence, yeah. demand it, sit down with the experts, critically analyze, so part of our educational mission is even uh, not just for those who are going to be producers of knowledge as researchers, but very specially for those who are be going to be in positions of policy or practice to be able to develop the competencies to be informed, intelligent consumers, users yeah. of evidence. And, yeah. and we tend to lose the other side. Uh, let me open it up now for comments, questions um, to Dr. Brundland. Hi, I'm, I'm Josh Glasser. I'm a master's student in the uh, Department of Global Health and Population. Um, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for your time. Um, I was interested to follow up kind of on this discussion we were just having about um, sort of the gap that I feel exists between um, many issues where there's kind of scientific consensus, um, but there's in sort of the public debate, uh, not just at the level of policymakers and decision makers, but at the level of public debate and the mass media and things, there's sort of um, doubt, confusion, perhaps it's intentionally placed, perhaps it's not, but how do we kind of bridge that gap between issues, say on reproductive health or climate change or tobacco, where there's extremely strong scientific evidence, uh, and then in the public arena, it's, it's just not there? Yeah, let me just uh, take tobacco as, as the first example. We knew when we started the tobacco initiative that there were people out there, uh, economic interests, the tobacco industry itself, 
advertising industry, many who will be opposed to what we were doing. So uh, we, we, it, it was part of our analysis of how to move to be aware of our enemies, quotation mark. But also another enemy, people placed inside the UN system or inside governmental offices dealing with public health. Uh, who were in some way linked with the tobacco industry. Insiders placed by the industry. Mm. So we even made an issue of that and made a report, you know, saw to it that we try to, uh, ex uh, to um, expose some of that. You know, to the ex this was done to shame people who were doing these kinds of things. And I'm sure it was a wise decision of us to try to inspire that happening, this report. Because when you then identified that this was happening, people got disgusted. It, one thing is to understand that the industry or the advertising industry are trying to counter your arguments w uh, about the evidence, you know, on the open arena trying to say, look, it's not dangerous, and uh, you know, and we know a man who is 90 who has smoked all these years, all these stupid things. <laughs> but in addition to that, you know, to expose that the, some of the methods they are using are not democratic, not transparent. So, the, the, but this is part of trying to reach public attention to a level that you undermine your opposition. This is, and we never knew whether we would succeed. It's a, it's a miracle that we had the convention after five years. But we certainly got early up in the morning and you know, stood up on doing this and shared the evidence. We also, by the way, I mentioned Richard Pito. He was one of those who had found that um, it, cessation is important. He had proved in his research that if you stop smoking, over some years, you reduce considerably the risk that you have already accomplished, you know, gained <laughs> by having been a smoker. So that was another issue which was very important to get to the front and to have people understand. Because how can you convince people who are in their 40s or 50s in, in the global population who have been smoking for 20 years? How, you know, how can you convince sufficient numbers of those not to oppose new legislation? higher taxation and all the things we had to do, if they think they are dead anyway. You know, if they think they are already, their destiny is done. No, they, it was not. So that's another example. Now climate, I mean, in this country, where you have had the, 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 the naysayers and the deniers about the reality of climate change for years and years, I mean, it's terrible. And, and we haven't succeeded completely. This is why we did not succeed in Copenhagen. Because of the force of the economic and other interests, pol political interests in this country and others, not to acknowledge the reality of climate change. But I am always, in the end, an optimist. If we haven't succeeded until now, and the evidence is so obvious, we just have to go on. It will succeed. Uh, yeah. Great. Um, Michael, you had. Thank you so much. My name is Michael Olubile. I'm an MP student in the Global Health Concentration. I'm from Nigeria. My question is about the role of WHO as a leader in health, health matters. I know at inception, WHO was founded as an arm of, as a arm of, of the UN to to be in charge of health matters. But now, in, in recent years, other UN agencies are also working on health matters. UNICEF, UNFPA, World Bank, they are working on health matters. So as a decision makers, what would be your advice to WHO to take its leadership, the leadership role in health matters? For example, I want to talk about the global effort in eradication of malaria. Now there are so many different arms, different bodies, working on malaria, but there must be a leader that will, that will set the goal 
and push everybody in line. So what, how can the WHO take that responsibility as a leader in the ultimate? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, say, I, I, I use the word center of excellence, you know. WHO has to be the center of excellence. The knowledge base, the normative function, that it is as an essential component of uh, combining the efforts that are happening around the world because they have to be on the basis of knowledge and evidence and a shared assessment of it, you know, from mortality statistics uh, to the way you deal with malaria, prevent it, etc. Now, but from then, you know, also when I was in WHO, there were people who were arguing WHO should be the leader, as if it was something given by God or something. <laughs> and I always knew, although I didn't always say it that way, but I knew that we have to be seen as the leader because we are, in fact, most competent to be. It's not enough that the world in 1948 created this body and for that reason everyone will bow you know for the next generations to whatever comes from there no and you know when you think about it unless there had been many actors on malaria unless the world bank and unicef and others had seen the importance of health we would have been worse off so why did we create alliances because we saw we need more people engaged, we need more resources, we need to take the benefit of people who can contribute, whether in malaria, in polio, uh, in, in any of the important issues that we deal with. But I do agree that it is stupid for the world not to see that we have a body that can combine this center of excellence normative function on behalf of everyone, because it is, this is an essential um, asset that the world has, the potential to have, and we should keep it. So I do agree with your, you know, your, your main premise here. Uh, and it means also that people who, I, I think funders generally, should request a link to WHO on the evidence and on the the normative side of issues, at least, if they are going to put a lot of money into an effort on prevention or, you know, or health systems or disease, uh, working on, on uh, combating disease. Because otherwise, the world gets more confused than what it needs to be. So, uh, and, but then you, you, you have to gain that confidence, you know, on, by the others. Because in this world, the people who have the money are the people who are making a part of the decision, you know? Uh, I remember I had to explain to public health officials in, in WHO when they said, but this should be a public uh, arena, you know? It should not be private. They did not like to have alliances with any private entity not even with the pharmaceutical industry. And I had to explain to them, look, I'm a social democrat. My country is one of the most advanced and progressive societies and welfare states in the world. As a leader of the Social Democratic Party and as a leader of government of Norway, I look at a mixed economy where the private sector plays a big role in what happens in my country. And unless you work with and regulate the private sector, your society is not going to flourish. And if you look at the world, I mean, the private sector is bigger than in Norway. In most developing countries, the private, first of all, the economies are small. But secondly, the public sector is tiny. And they are not able to do what they need to do to take care of basic needs of their people. So, I mean, the whole, this whole question of thinking that everything needs to be public to be good, 
It's not right. It's not, it's not going to work. However, there has to be public attention and public frameworks and regulations on what happens in the private sector. And they have to be helped inspire good common interest on behalf of societies, each one, and the world. Which is what we have been doing when we have been building the alliances, pushing the pharmaceutical industry to get down their prices on the AIDS medicines. In the beginning, they couldn't believe what we were asking, but they did. So I'm sure unless we had done that public-private partnership and working with the pharmaceutical, it wouldn't have happened. You know, so you need, you need to analyze where are the, the forces of, of the world, the economic, but also people, more people than what we sometimes uh, suspect, want to be part of doing good if they are helped to do so. And this is, I think, what we have seen. I am now on the United Nations Foundation Board. Why am I there? It's the, oh, the only obligation I took on when I left WHO 2003 was to be on that board. Why? Because Ted Turner gave $1 billion to UN and UN causes. And a foundation was created for this enormous gift that he gave. And after that, as you know, you have Gates, you have, uh, what's his companion? Buff, yeah, sorry, I, I mean, yeah, Warren Buffett. Now, I mean, you know, this additional effort to whatever the taxation and the ODA and what people are paying out of the taxation money, that's needed, both for WHO itself, but for whatever, what we can do globally to improve global health. We need public and private attention to make things happen. And there's, there's no question that a big part of, I mean, probably your mm. most important legacy at WHO was to raise the visibility yeah. of health and make it really a matter that went beyond ministries of health. And that has created these challenges of pluralism. Yes, yes. But, but, but I think the point here is that, you know, you can have that pluralistic global health system as long as you have a strong yeah. steward, which is the, the main role of, of the WHO. Mm. But, but I, 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 it's clearly better to have health to be so prominent that you now have all these alliances, all this participation, mm -hmm. that you have it relegated to a corner of obscurity where only the technical experts are interested. And I, I, I do think that's her, her main legacy. We had... Um, Thank you. You, can you stand up? Oh. <laughs> uh, my name is Surinder Sharma. I am an MPH student here and I come from India. Before coming here, I worked in polio eradication. And after coming here, I'm changing my vision to a different uh, strategy altogether, realizing the need of that. But my question is uh, twofold. First and foremost, with the changing millennia, how do you see the change of changing role of WHO? Like in the last millennia, we had seen a different WHO than what we are seeing today. The ground realities are different, the players are different, and the role will be different. And the second one is comparing the true crude example of SARS versus H1N1. How do you see? Versus? SARS oh, yes, yes, versus and H1N1, yeah. yeah. How do you see th those two realities? Because they, that might give a peek into the what holds in future for WHO. Yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, Julio, you are as knowledgeable on the influenza uh, part of this as I am, certainly. But, but I, I looked at it only now from the outside, you know, reading newspapers, following uh, events at the global level, what happened in Norway and across the world on this. And the Mexi they started in Mexico and all of that. Um, now, then later on, WHO was criticized for having overdone the issue, made it a bigger issue than what it was or what it turned out to be, and uh, you know, accused of having made a big mistake when as much vaccine was developed as what happened. Okay, you know better how to judge the thing. I have tried when people easily want to ask me, I have avoided coming out with any critical voice against WHO. Why? I decide I'm not going to enter into it to have my personal opinion about it. I'm just saying to myself, 
If the WHO had do done the opposite, not taking seriously something that potentially was very dangerous, then I think I would rather be criticized as a director general for having done more than having done too little. So without going into any of the, you know, uh, that's how I sense I have to protect that we have a system that can act and can give recommendations, even when sometimes things are not as bad as they looked. Okay, Julio, do I, am I right or not? You're absolutely right, Anne. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would say yeah. that the, the case of, um, of SARS mm. illustrates the ability of uh, making yeah. decisions with courage. Because SARS really set the stage, as, as you yourself yeah. sa yeah. sa said, to, to redo the international health regulations and give much more authority to the WHO. Um, and we did study the case of SARS in a class on, on global health governance. Yeah and how it requires someone like yourself who had been a head of government mm -hmm. to actually be able to stand up to a lot of governments that had been accustomed to a WHO that never actually made decisions that in any way would question total sovereignty. We saw it with SARS, we saw it with the health systems rankings, Yes, you know, the ability to say we are accountable to the world as large. We protect the common good of the entire world, even if that may affect a particular government. And that mindset has totally changed the authority of the WHO. And you know, we saw it with, with, with H1N1. We have just a couple of minutes, so we'll get uh, a last question. And then you know, the, the beauty of the webcast is you can actually send comments, and we will make sure that That's Dr. Brundtland reads them uh, and, and they will be posted on the website. So, my go ahead. Ashwan Afshin, I'm a postdoc at the Department of Epidemiology. Uh, my question is, as a leader who has held several leadership position, uh, have you ever made an incorrect decision? And if yes, how did you deal with that? Yeah, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, you know, you were uh, even more direct than some people who, who try to ask that kind of question. Because you said incorrect decision. Um, then, you know, that gets it very close to a, a kind of evidence-based decision making, you know? But many times if a journalist asks this question, what they mean is, can you admit that you ever made a mistake? Because this is the typical thing that you want a politician to be, you know, being uh, humble and explaining how he or she made a mistake. Now. I have always, when that question comes, I've thought, have I ever used all my judgment, my knowledge, my overview of a situation, and made a decision which one or two years later I felt was wrong? I'm not sure. I don't find them easily, I have to tell you. Because there is, in, in that kind of decision making, also in a democracy where my integrity, yes, my, the basis for decision making, but if you have a government, for instance, and the government has to judge two alternative decisions, and you have a democratic mindset with regard to decision making also, because I'm not a dictator, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm a person listening to others' point of view on judgment question, not on evidence. Because if we don't agree on the evidence, then that means we have to do some more study before we, but as the evidence is there, and people have different opinions about what's right and wrong, what's most important. Then it has happened that I have let the majority of my cabinet, my government, determine what position we take, even if I would have preferred the other one. Because of my respect for other people's opinions, backgrounds, experience. So kind of in a majority situation where people have made another selection. As a prime minister in Norway, you can decide. Even if you have a majority of the government addressing themselves in the other direction. I remember one example. 
uh, where I myself was in doubt. What is the right thing to do? It was the Norwegian bank system was completely bankrupt, or nearly was bankrupt. The government had to, and this is 1990, no. the government had to buy the stocks of the banks to avoid bankruptcy. The question was, in the end, we all agreed that this was necessary. We did it. We also said, but it doesn't mean we are going to take over the two big banks in Norway and, and make them now national banks. We are going to have to gradually to sell back <clears throat> to the private sector so that we have a balance in the banks that are, they are a, a, a private majority, but we, we left some government money into it to balance the system. The question was, what about the stockholders? Are they going to be zeroed out for nothing, to have nothing? Or are they going to have 10 cents per stock, which would give them a potential as the banks gradually regain their strength? Yeah. It sounds maybe as a simple decision, but it certainly wasn't. Because the question was, are the stockholders going to lose everything they invested? Uh, or are the taxpayers going to take the burden? I mean, this was the question. And the, the people around the table, all I think were, you know, balancing, finding what is right. And as most of them had spoken, I realized that there was a, there was a 50-50 around the table. I was the last one. So what I did, I was in doubt myself, like all the others. So what I then did was follow what the finance minister had said. Because, you know, I was the deciding vote, in a sense. And I followed, and I used, I said, I am in doubt, as I know most of you are. But in this case, since I have the final vote, I'm going to follow the uh, proposal that the finance minister had done. But he, he said there are two options. You know, he was also in doubt. <laughs> and then you can say, how do you judge today, 20 years later, or even five years later, what would have been the right decision in that case? Who is to judge? This is often the situation. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> let me um, bring this uh, fabulous conversation to a close just by um, drawing some of the lessons, I think for especially our students who are keen to understand the thought processes that go into decision making. But I, I would say from this conversation, I wrote down a number of lessons. First, a very, very strong base of integrity. And Gro repeated that word several times. A value base, a set of clear principles that paradoxically then becomes, makes you a stronger politician, not the opposite because the fact that you that everyone knows that you will not mm -hmm. compromise on your principles mm -hmm. gives you a position of strength in any negotiation. So I would take that as a very stay, she said, with the things you believe in. If some, there's something there that you believe in, stay with that. Mm -hmm. Learn to spot opportunities even if unexpected. You know, Winston Churchill had this fabulous phrase. You know, we, we there are times in our life where opportunity figuratively taps us on our shoulder. We yeah, need yeah. to be able to listen. And that's how she got tapped uh, in, into many of these incredible responsibilities. Broaden the scope of your agenda. And that's exactly what you did at mm -hmm. WHO. That's what you did with the Brutland Commission. Mm -hmm. It was gonna be, narrowly you said, no, let's broaden yeah. the scope. And, 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 and um, I think that's a, if, and, and connect it to other people's concerns. And then, of course, this idea of respect for knowledge, making uh, you know, knowledge the center, this idea of a center of excellence, but the respect for knowledge, which goes back to the integrity. These are two twins, those two sides of the same coin. And the last thing I thought was very, very interesting. Listen to everyone, empower your collaborators, and at the end, you know, make the decision. But after you listen, it goes, again, with, the, with, with what one would call an enlightened process of decision making. So you've seen it here uh, in action. We're very proud that you are actually our alumna. 
we want to think that Harvard School of Public Health had something to do with uh, yeah. this fantastic set of accomplishments. And we're very grateful that you're back here to now give these people who will follow in many of your footsteps the chance to learn from this extraordinary set of accomplishments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoyed it.